I'm going to talk to you just for a few minutes about some work that we've been doing um, and which feeds in very nicely to projects which are illustrated on the posters at the back of the room um, that discuss how we may be able to recruit the immune system to cure cancers, including head and neck cancer. And so the question that I'm going to pose is, are we going to cure metastatic head and neck cancer? So metastatic head and neck cancer being that phase of the disease where it's spread away from the original site in the throat or in the neck and has got into the bloodstream, has travelled through the lungs, the liver, the bone. And traditionally, we have been taught for the last 50, 100 years that once the disease does that, there is nothing that we can do to get rid of it. And I think we're on the verge of changing that situation. Now, those of you who subscribe to the magazine Science, and I suspect there may be a minority of you in the room, um, it's not quite as good as the Beano. Um, it's, uh, it's a journal that every now and again it comes out with something which I think is, um, is, is really important and it makes a statement. And one of the things that it does every single year, on its front page, it has the breakthrough of the year. Now, if you subscribed to this journal back in the 70s, you would have seen a title that looked very much the same as this. Immunotherapy is about to cure cancer. And that's about the time that they were discovering proteins called interferons, which are part of the normal response our body makes to virus infections, actually. But when you use them in certain types of tumours, every now and again, you see the tumour go away completely. And back in the 70s, everyone was very optimistic that all we had to do was understand what was going on, tweak the proteins a little bit, and we'd be able to cure everything, and it never materialised. Three years ago, it was back on the front cover, but this time not with interferons, with this thing called immunotherapy. And so what I'm going to try to do in the next two or three minutes, maybe a little longer, is describe where we are with immunotherapy in head and neck cancer. Now, unfortunately, all of these talks appear to have very complicated diagrams. And I, forgive me for this one, which I think is a really beautiful diagram. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of the elements of this. You'll be relieved to hear. But many of you will probably have heard, some of you may have said, and I've certainly thought, about this notion that we're all thought to get cancers at some point in our lives. And most of us get rid of them most of the time. In some patients, unfortunately, the body doesn't clear the cancer and it grows and it forms a tumour that then threatens someone's health and their life. And this is illustrated in this slide here. So it is thought that every day we are bombarded with radiation from outer space, from the environment we live in, toxic chemicals that we take in by mouth, um, things that are in the water, things in the air that we breathe, and they cause mutations in our cells. And if those mutations hit in a certain point, potentially they can make that cell behave in a malignant fashion, which, when they accumulate, can make that cell into a cancer cell. Thankfully, it appears that our immune system is capable of seeing those cells and eliminating them most of the time. But sometimes, those cancer cells can mount a counterattack against the immune system, and you get into a sort of ceasefire or a truce the so-called equilibrium phase, where the cancer is still undetectable by any scan or you can't see it by naked eye, but the immune system is unable to get rid of all of the cells. And that's a dangerous situation, because if that cancer cell gets further immu <coughs> mutations, it can break free of that equilibrium phase and potentially escape and then become the tumours that we see in our patients next door in the hospital every day, that then ultimately can get more mutations, can threaten to spread through the body and kill our patients and kill members of your families um, that you obviously will know all too well. But the important thing that we learned is that the tumour cells that we face, even when they've spread through the body, are not invisible to the immune system. The immune system can still see them. The trouble is they can't kill them. And that's been a massive paradox for decades. We know that tumour cells have mutations. We know those mutations make proteins which are not the same as the normal proteins that our bodies express. And we know that the immune system should be able to attack those cells and kill them. And we don't know why or we didn't know why that didn't happen. And now we begin to understand it. So forgive me for these diagrams. These are cartoons that I drew 
and the colours don't project brilliantly, but I'm going to try and walk you through this. So here, this is a tumour cell that expresses this pink triangle, which is a, an abnormal protein, but this cell, which is an immune cell called a T cell, has a receptor that can recognise. And in theory, that T cell recognising that protein should activate that T cell to kill the tumour cell. And indeed, that may well happen. That first signal may lead to the T cell engaging with and killing the tumour cell. It may kill the second, the third, the hundredth, the thousandth tumour cell it sees. But the trouble is when it starts doing that, it gets excited and it puts a protein on its surface here, which is called PD-1, which we'll come back to. And it also begins to secrete one of these interferons. And that interferon is there to recruit its friends to come and join in the feeding frenzy at the tumour. But the trouble is that interferon gamma also sends a signal sometimes to the tumour cell because the tumour cell can have a mutation that allows it to have the receptor on its surface. And when it sees that interferon gamma, the tumour cell is capable of making another protein called PDL1. Now, PD stands for programmed death, and PDL1 stands for programmed death ligand. A ligand is something that binds to a receptor. So the situation we find ourselves in, the T cell that was happily chomping away at the tumour and killing as many tumour cells as it could, is now in a situation where something else is binding to it. And that PDL1 activating the PD1 can kill the T cell and switch it off. So that T cell response that was doing so well for the patient stops working and the T cells get switched off. It's analogous to the tumor cell being able to press a light switch on the tumor, on the T cell and just turn it off, turn out the lights. So having told you all of that complex biology that's taken decades to work out, I want to show you the end point of some of this in head and neck cancer. So these are data that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine on Sunday. And this is the first ever phase three clinical trial to show that we can improve survival in patients with head and neck cancer with these sorts of drugs. And the way this drug, and you'll have to forgive me, they've all got silly names. This one's called nivolumab. There's another drug called pembrolizumab. There's a drug called etezolizumab. And there's another one called um, Avelumab, all of which we're working with next door. And what this graph shows us, and it's not perfect, and it's not enough, but it shows us the following. When you take a group of patients who have had surgery, they've had radiation therapy, they've had chemotherapy when the disease has spread through their body, and all of those treatments have failed, they then get randomised into a trial, this trial called Checkmate 141, at the Royal Marsden Hospital, we recruited the second largest number of patients of any centre in the world into this study. And they were randomised against the standard of care chemotherapy, which we knew from decades of work, work very badly indeed. So three different drugs, none of which is very impressive. And what do we see? We see the average survival, which is the time it takes sadly for 50% of the patients in either group to die, is increased by a little bit over two months, which is lamentably bad. But what's really important is that you see that at one year, twice as many patients receiving the nivolumab are still alive compared with the standard of care. And in this study, we have patients who've been on treatment or indeed have stopped treatment, but they had the treatment more than three years ago. And as far as we can tell, their disease has gone or is permanently stabilized. And so we can begin to dream for the first time that we can cure people who have relapsed head and neck cancer. There's another study that's coming called the Keynote 040 study. Again, we were the global highest recruiters into that study. And there are a range of other trials that are coming in this setting where the disease has come back and has been treated multiply, or more importantly, when it comes back the first time, or better still, when it's diagnosed at the very beginning what about if we could combine these drugs with the radiation and the chemotherapy that we use and cure people so they never get this problem? What about, better still, if we didn't have to use cisplatin alongside the radiation? 
I fear some of you in the room have had that drug. I've prescribed it hundreds of times, thousands of times. I've never had it, but I see what it does. And it's a thoroughly unpleasant drug. I'd never like to prescribe it again if I didn't have to. And maybe we can replace it with drugs like this. So that's the research that we're doing, trying to improve cure rates by using these drugs. Now, at the back of the room, you'll find some posters. Uh, and you'll find the eager researchers who've been doing the work um, in my lab and in other labs uh, who've been working on immunotherapies. And one of the focuses that we have in my lab is using virus therapies, again analogous to the work that Caroline Springer um, has shown you today, using viruses to trigger immune responses. And so there's some really beautiful work that is presented by Vicky Rulston, by Joan Kiula, by Martin McLaughlin, and then some really lovely work as well on thyroid cancer, which is presented by Eva Crespo Rodriguez and Kate Bergerhoff, and they're all along the back there, and the posters are really lovely. And one of the things that we're learning is that some of the standard therapies that we have used, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, can also activate the immune response, but it doesn't do well enough to cure the disease. But if we can tweak it by adding other treatments such as viruses, antibodies such as this, or small molecule inhibitors, maybe we can get to the point where we can cure more of our patients with head and neck cancer, ultimately one day, maybe every patient who we see. And that's the sort of work that is supported by Oracle Cancer Trust, and I'd also like to recognize um, publicly here the support of the Mark Donegan Foundation, who have extremely generously supported the work that we've been doing. And I know that members of Mark's family are in the audience today, and I would publicly like to thank you for that support. And I look forward to answering any questions that you have. Thank you.